everybody, and welcome to The Art of Aging, which is part of the Abundant Aging podcast series from United Church Homes. On this show, we look at what it means to age in America and in other places around the world with positive and empowering conversations that challenge, encourage, and inspire all to age with abundance. As uh, part of our Aging and Innovation series, uh, very pleased to welcome Andy Miller to the show today. Andy is a Senior Vice President of AARP's Innovation Labs, which is an entity that I'll tell you has just grown and grown in, in terms of the impact it's having and uh, fostering new and important solutions in the aging and healthcare space. And Andy, you are certainly no stranger to innovation. Uh, you've got a track record that includes uh, being the innovation lead at Constant Contact. You founded the Small Business Innovation Loft. You founded and sold a number of companies. And oh, by the way, you've held ro roles uh, in innovation at financial players like T. Rowe Price, Bank of America. Whew. And uh, we're so pleased to have you on the show today. Welcome, Andy. Well, thanks. I'm, I'm glad to be here, Michael. Uh, for listeners that are uh, uh, listening to this at time of release, just a friendly reminder that our Ruth Frost Parker Center for Abundant Aging is holding its annual symposium in October of this year. I believe it's October 6th through Friday. Theme is Ending Ageism and uh, attend live in Columbus or attend virtually uh, at a very, very, very terrific price. So just visit uh, www.unitedchurchhomes.org slash Parker hyphen center. All righty. So Andy, just to start things off, um, describe AARP's Innovation Labs to me. What, what, what are the jobs that you and your staff do? <laughs> yeah, so AARP Innovation Labs has been around for about seven years now, uh, and it's, it's changed over time. Uh, we started out trying to build our own products, building our own startups. Uh, now we really focus on uh, working with startups. We realize that we are far better equipped to find the best startups we can in the world, uh, that are focused on the issues we care about most. And we bring them in. We run pitch events to find them all over the country. Uh, we, we will then bring them into an accelerator program, which I think we're going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, and we run these accelerator programs uh, four times a year. And then we, we help them. We help them validate what they're doing. We help them refine it. And then we want to ultimately help them grow or scale their business. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and, you know, I got I to gotta think, you know, incubator programs, accelerator programs, it seems like every big company's got one, you know, we, we see them. I, I don't think not so much an age check, and we'll unpack that in a second, but, um, you know, what you're doing at AARP just seems a little bit different from other tr traditional accelerator or, or incubator programs, right? What, what, what were you seeing out there with other programs of that type that you thought you could do better at or you, you were looking to correct? Yeah, so when we started this, we actually partnered with, with one of those. We partnered with, with a company called Mass Challenge. Uh, it's the largest non-equity accelerator in the world. And they were launching a new program called, at the time it was called Mass Challenge Pulse. Today it's called Health Tech. And the intent was to find startups and pair them with companies to try and get a little bit further down the path. So it wasn't just a mentoring model. And so we were a founding member, and this was back, I think, in 2000, maybe 18, 19. Um, and we worked with like 30 companies over the years through Mass Challenge Health Tech. And it was really, really beneficial for us to learn how to work with startups, to learn what they really need. Uh, we, we see companies or other accelerators like Techstars or Y Combinator, and there's dozens, as you mentioned. And, and I'm not knocking any of them. They are, they're, they're all great programs, but they're all very different. Right, Techstars and Y Combinator, which are probably the two most well-known, uh, they're basically venture capital firms at the end of the day. They, they're finding companies, they're investing in them, and then off they go. Right? Uh, and, and we decided that wasn't really what we wanted to do. We were trying to find companies that we could actually help. We can roll our sleeves up and put our money where our mouth is, if you will. A lot of these uh, different programs, incubators and accelerators, rely heavily on the mentor model, which is they find a bunch of guys like me and you, and they have us come in and talk to startups and give their two cents and advice. And while that may be helpful, what we've heard from startups time and time again is, you and I may show up and give them completely different pieces of advice on the same topic. So what do they do? Who do they listen to? How are they gonna actually move forward? And so we, our program is 100% bespoke. Right. So when we bring startups in, they are given a uh, portfolio manager from my team and they build a custom agenda just for them. Even though they may be in a cohort of 15 or 16 companies, 
each company is getting their own unique sort of programmatic way that we're going to go through the next eight weeks with them when they, when they join the cohort. We give them resources that they don't get at other places, right? So they may get access to mentors, sure. They get access to subject matter experts from ARP, which is highly valuable. Uh, and then we give them access to things like GLG, right? Which is a service where you get industry experts that'll come talk to you. We have access to feedback loop and other things where they can test and iterate really quickly. And we do all of this, we pay for it. We give them the resource. We almost become an extension of their team for eight weeks. And there's a, a, a byproduct of that. We also have started to invest in these companies. We don't make any investment decisions till after they graduate from the cohort. So it gives us eight weeks of working with the founders, working with their platform, their, their service, their offering, their product to understand, is it real? Is it providing a real value to the users? Is it solving a real problem? Can the founders actually tackle this, this problem, produce something and grow it? That's far more insight than almost any investor would have before making an investment decision. And so not only are we helping them, we're helping ourselves. I mean, I, I, I got to say here, Andy, I mean, you know, the, the, the models I've seen, the, the models I've seen in incubator and accelerator programs are you come in, we're going to take a piece of your company, you know, whatever percent on the cap table it's going to yep. be. And it's almost like, let's just, whatever happens, happens, you know, we'll get a bunch of guys, we'll make these bets, we'll throw them out there. We'll kind of put it, it's kind of just a little scatter shot, right? I mean, this seems a lot more focused, a lot more curated. It, it is. I mean, in, in what you're describing is really the Techstars YC model, right? Which is, you know, we're going to, Techstars, I think, made over 500 investments last year throughout all of their programs. And, you know, it's very programmatic. You come in, we're going to write you a hundred thousand dollar check. We're going to take roughly 5% of your company. We're going to reserve the right to write another hundred thousand dollar check. And, and you're going to come through our program for two or three months. And in those two or three months, basically what we're going to do is teach you how to pitch for more money, right? Along the way, we may get you a deal or two to help validate what you're doing so you can get more money, right? But that's primarily what, what all the, the accelerators do. You're seeing more and more what I'll call corporate foundries popping up, which is a little bit different, right? Corporate foundries are, um, you know, a big company says we want to basically outsource R&D. Uh, we don't want to necessarily go play with a big accelerator. We just want to do it ourselves. So they may hire a company. There's a lot of them out there, Generator Ventures, uh, uh, Hire, Hire Alpha. Like there's a bunch of these, these companies that will come up and spin up sort of product development functions that they will help solve. So if you have a, uh, something you really want to solve for as a big corporate, you don't have the research, the know-how to create a startup, this foundry concept someone else will go and take your ideas, run with them and build something and then flip it back to you. So I want to build a better, better mousetrap. I have an idea what the mousetrap is. You hire an outside company. You, you say, okay, let's stand up like that. It's not a hackathon. It's not whatever. It's, it's basically, you know, throwing out a net and finding out who is working on that issue from a startup point of view and then inviting them to come in and maybe fostering them that way. So I can run a specific challenge on this, a specific challenge on, on that. Uh, interesting corporate founder. Just just back to the um, back to the HTech Collaborative though. If you've already gone through one of these programs, does that does that kind of restrict you from participating in as an HTech uh, uh, company? No, it doesn't. In fact, we've actually cut some deals with with our friends at Mass Challenge and TechStars. But um, we have a number. I'm probably close to half of our startups that, that come through our program have been through another accelerator. Uh, in in it's interesting because the validation we get on our model when we do our surveying at the end, you know, net promoter score kind of thing, our net promoter score is far north of 90. And we've been doing this now for five years, um, four cohorts a year. So uh, at first I thought maybe there was a halo effect, but no, the model is being validated every single cohort. And it's because of the, the custom agenda, it's because of the resources we give them and how we're actually helping them validate, refine, and grow. Yeah, you know, and it just seems natural for AARP, given its position in the aging space, to, to have something like this. And also, it just seems to be a very altruistic, you know, it's, if a nonprofit was going to do it, to do this model, they would do it this way. But I know this has a, also has a lot to do with your vision, what you're seeking to kind of correct that's out there. But just, just switching just the, the, the topic of kind of aging, health, and all that, I just... It, it's almost like it's the Rodney Dangerfield of the VC and investment world. You know, age check gets no respect. You know, I know that I know that um, you know 
as long as I've been in this space, it, it seems like it's getting some momentum. I mean, the, the world's aging, you know, people are, the, the problem is of, 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 of our long-term care crisis is, is starting to become yeah. a little bit more real now. But at the same time, you know, I can't, I, I don't have a sense of comparison of where age tech is in terms of its momentum of investment compared to other things. I mean, where do you think age tech is right now? You think it's still Rodney Dangerfield? You think it's, it's coming out of its, sh its shadow a little bit? Yeah, I, I definitely think it's coming out of its shadow. Uh, specifically, we're seeing more and more venture funds start age tech funds, right? We're seeing uh, established VCs starting age tech funds. We're seeing brand new venture funds formed around age tech. It, I think what, what's happened is all the research around what I'll call longev longevity economy, right? Where, like, where the money is, where the demographics going. Uh, once you, you, know, you think about a Silicon Valley VC, they tended to want to fund technology, mobile tech, different things like that, that were focused on 18 to 35 year old males. Well, that's great. And they are very early adopters. And some of AARP's research has helped in this, but we've been able to show that the myths that old people don't use tech, not true. In fact, 50 to 60 year olds are the single largest group using early adopters the biggest spend of disposable income on new tech, it's not the 18 to 35 year old. So you're seeing as the population shifts, the money is shifting. And so a lot of these companies, what do they do? They're chasing money, right? At the end of the day, they're trying to make product that they can you know, grow that, scale that business, and then, then exit that business. And so they tend to go where there's a big population, there's a big addressable market, there's lots of dollars. So they're starting to kind of understand what, what that is now. The, the second piece of the longevity economy is that tech piece, as I just mentioned. It, it's a myth that old people don't use tech, right? COVID was actually a great accelerant for this, for the older population, right? They, they had to use tech. Maybe they were using tech to, to look at Facebook, pictures of the grandkids. Maybe they were using FaceTime, but they still had to go to the doctor. So they started using telehealth. They still had to pay their bills. They started using online banking. And the list goes on and on. And so they became much more comfortable with the technology and therefore they adopt, they're adopting more and more. Yeah. And you know what, you know what just occurs to me is that, you know, in some of those cases, you're right. There is a trope out there. I mean, I'm not seeing it when I'm, when I'm looking at the residents of our, of our, of our properties. I mean, I think the, the people that are moving into independent living now retired 15 years ago. What was around 15 years ago? You know, the internet was around, you know, yeah. smartphones were around, social media was around. So these are not unfamiliar things. I think it's, and I think there's sort of an element of maybe us learning together, right? You know, you, 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 there's a, you know, during COVID, we all had to learn about telehealth. We all had to learn about Zoom. We all had to do this. So it was almost, uh, you know, I don't know what, what sort of an element, what sort of the, what that did to accelerating tech adoption amongst older people, but I, I would suggest that all of our, for all of us, tech adoption it increased. Like yeah, exactly. absolutely. Did. And I think the, the other thing to really consider here is the not just the demographic, but the geographical dispersion of the demographic. So when I was younger, my entire extended family lived within 20 minutes of each other. Like I could drive to my aunts, my grandparents, anyone's house, right? That we all lived right near each other. And what's happened is families have moved. And, you know, my parents live in Sarasota. My sister lives in Northern Virginia. I live in Boston. Well, how do we still stay not just engaged, right? We want to, we want to make sure that we're socially engaged with one another, but how is my parents age in particular? How do I make sure that they're getting the tech that's going to help them? That's getting, you know, whether it's ambient monitoring or whether it's fall prevention, whatever it is. I, and I want to make sure that they have that as well. I'm extremely technologically sophisticated. So I'm going to make buying decisions for my parents. And you're seeing that happen over and over and over where the adult children who are very sophisticated are starting to help their parents uh, adopt certain things because it's not only helpful for the parents, but it's helpful for me. Right. right? The right. other piece I'll bring up is intergenerational connectivity. Right. So we're seeing more and more uh, technologies that are really interesting. So uh, not to... to turn this into an infomercial for any of our companies, but I'm going to use one that I think is fascinating. It's a company called Gameboard. And what they've been able to do is create a digital version of all the games we grew up on, right? And so my mom can have a digital version of this on her coffee table. 
I could have one in, in here with my, my grandkids can be playing a game in real time with my mom. We could have family game night on a Friday night. Like that didn't exist before. And now we're seeing tech that's enabling us to do things we did a long time ago when we all lived right near each other. And we can do that again. And it's creating more and more sense of community amongst families and beyond. So that's, it's fascinating to me what the technology is doing. I mean, that's, a, you know, that, and, and I just want to, just for our listeners, I want to make a point pretty clear here. I mean, I consider there's only really two certainties market-wise in life right now, the age wave and climate change, right? There is a lot of money to be made in the age wave, right? There is a lot of opportunity here. And it's just about unpacking those different sort of themes or, 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 or just really kind of getting in and finding what people want as age when we can take into, into your to early, earlier point, the technology is not that barrier anymore. You know, the trope of the old person, you know, not being able to use it, that is not what's happening right now. So you mentioned, you know, the, you know, intergenerational tech is maybe one thing you're getting excited about. When you think about just the huge market opportunity that there is around aging right now, where would you be putting your dollars right now? And what, what, what do you think is the is is is, is where, where should be people be finding solution? Yeah. So one thing that I I know is happening is, um, and it doesn't matter where it takes place, people want to age in a home well. Right, uh, and you you have this quandary of letting me age well as the person living in that home or that physical space, but it goes beyond me. As I mentioned, you know, it's 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 the it's the grandparents' parents, it's the adult children, and they want to have these connections. So what's getting me excited right now is this concept we've been working on uh, with a, with one of the largest uh, electronics companies. I, I can't quite mention who yet. Um, but this concept of a living lab and a living lab, it's about aging well in, you know, people often talk about aging in place. I don't actually like that. Cause I think it's a negative term. Maybe you talk about thriving in place, right? And, and what's key about that, the word thriving and the word place, a place is just li literally a physical place where you're going to live, right? So how do we use tech to make sure you're thriving? And so this idea of a living lab, it could be in an independent living, assisted living. It could be at a, an ADU that I dropped in my backyard for my mom to live in. It could be any of these things, right? Uh, and, and so how do we bring together a collection of curated tech that will make sense, that will be fun? In some cases, you may not even know it exists. And it's just there to, to make sure I'm doing okay, right? So... That's really getting me excited because if you look at the world of tech or startups today, almost every single one of them does something well, but it's a point solution. And in and of itself, you're like, okay, that's kind of interesting. And I always use the example, one of our companies called Kasana. It's a smart toilet seat, right? You sit on it, it takes your, it not just weighs you, but it takes vitals, it does all this stuff. In and of itself, that's interesting, right? Great, I went to the bathroom at 10.05, it gathers some data, yeah, like, right? Like maybe over time it creates a trend. But if you think about this concept of a living lab and you have lots of tech at the same time happening in a, in, a, in a physical place, I can start to get contextual insight that I didn't have before, right? I know what the person was doing right before they went to the bathroom potentially, right? So if they were using another company, we have own practice, right? It's a, it's sort of like, Peloton for yoga, I know they hate when I say that, but it's, it's sort of like this on-demand interactive exercise. Well, maybe they were doing that right before they went. So the toilet seat registered a high heart rate. Well, without knowing what they did right before that, the data is somewhat useless, right? So really being able to look at all of the data that's being used to help someone live and thrive in place and create contextual insight by bringing and aggregating all that data together is what gets me the most excited. It, it's a term, it's a tremendous data play, Andy. I mean, this this is what's going through my mind right now. Is and, and this is a speech I've, I've given. <laughs> people have suffered through in the past, but you know, if I'm somebody that's newly diagnosed with, let's say, a chronic disease, right? Um, there are gonna there's already databases out there. They'll kind of size me up, age, weight, background, all this, and they may just sort of find a cohort for me and a bunch of other people that are okay. This medication may work better than others, or this treatment may. In terms of overall wellness and aging, all the factors that just support 
wellness and aging, you know, your, 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 your relationships, mm -hmm. how engaged you are. I mean, Bob Kramer had a great, great uh, line about uh, an engagement index where, you know, I, I don't want to go out because my hands are shaking, you know, all, all of the different, obviously home state, uh, you know, the, 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 the traditional social determinants like food and transport and all that. Yeah. But a lot of this stuff around behavior and correlating behavior, I mean, that, that's a huge opportunity, right? Enormous. And, and the reality is it's not been done before, I think, for a couple of reasons. One, all the startups are too small, right? They're just chasing their point solution, whatever it is that they're going to do and do really well. And then if, they, if they're successful, you'll see them branch out, right? They become more and more. But the reality is this is an enormous data play. So there's privacy issues, there's infrastructure issues, and there's, to be frank, there's only probably five companies in the world that are capable of probably pulling something like this off at, at a ubiquitous sort of societal level. Uh, and, and they're all now, if you, if you look at all the big companies, right, uh, whether it's Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Samsung, Google, they all have Best Buy, they all have health now. Right. There's Apple health. Right. right? right and so right. they're all not only waking up to the longevity economy and the opportunities, they're, they're literally sitting here going, well, how do we help shape it? Right. And so if you look across those organizations, they each have slightly different approaches to things. Right. You can imagine Amazon being the, the ultimate e-commerce engine, being able to know all about you and your day, use your data to make better recommendations on what you should you know, be eating or, or buying or whatever. Um, you know, same thing with the Best Buy, right? Interesting about someone like a Samsung or an Apple, they're in our lives every day and we don't realize it. Whether yes. it's the phones, the TVs, the microwaves, the water, whatever it is, we're using all of their tech all the time. And you, we probably don't realize how much we... It's, well, we have a story because they play those little songs, you know, every time my, 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 my dryer's done, it plays a song. My, 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 my dishwasher's done, it plays a little song. But no, I, 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 I totally get it. I mean, these, these are, you know... You, probably, you, you interact with it more than you think. Right. And so if you stitch all that together and you layer on top of it, these point solutions that are very precise, they've been built to do one thing, one thing really well. So an, a device that may be doing ambient monitoring, right? It, and, and I'm going to get way too techy for a minute here. You know, you stick it on the wall and all you see is a box on the wall, but it's actually creating a radio mesh network that's seeing if you're standing, sitting, walking, if you've fallen, if you've eaten, if you've gone to the bathroom, you're maybe it even can track your heart rate. Like, that exists and to fade into the background and you don't even know it's there, but to connect that with all this other insight and information is, I just, I get really, really excited about this opportunity. Yeah, I, I can, I can kind of tell, but I, I, I share your excitement. All right, let's flip it. Let, let's flip it around a little bit. You're, you're, you see a lot of stuff. I see a lot of stuff. Um, some stuff gets you, you know, sort of puts a light bulb in your head. What is the stuff that basically gives you a snore? Yeah. What is the stuff that you hit the delete button on? I mean, what, what should people not be developing in age? Yeah. Right so, so I'm going to caveat this by saying, I know this is a really, really important topic that I'm about to snooze on, but I know it is. So falls, I understand how important it is to detect falls. It's more important to prevent falls than detect falls, I would say. Right. And so, you know, if I see another wearable, fall detection device I mean, there's a bazillion of them you know at the end of the day all the ones that are tied to watches apple's gonna you know and, and google and samsung are gonna make you obsolete at some point i mean apple health is already doing all of this stuff in the watch uh, yes it's super important but we just see so many of these things and it's just okay i don't need to see another watch app that is telling me that someone has fallen down and, and what's interesting about that I was talking to uh, a gentleman the other day. Um, he happens to be the uh, chairman of a big uh, Wall Street firm, and, and we've been trying to talk about um, their customer base is older, and, and he wants us to go and talk about all these things. And he was telling me that he golfs a lot. And when he takes a divot when he's golfing, his watch thinks he's fallen down. And he <laughs> asked me if I knew why that was. And I said, well, I can't tell you with 100% certainty, but my guess is it uses the accelerometer. So as you're, you're coming down on your golf swing, when it gets interrupted by you hitting the ground and, and you know, he's probably not really following through, so he just literally falls, it thinks you've fallen. And he, and he said, you know, I probably fall you know, 20 times during a round of golf because I keep taking divots. And so even the technology that exists is not full, foolproof. And so 
a combination of technologies is going to be much, a much better solution than just a single point. So again, come back to this idea of how do I, how do I capture contextual insight from many things at the same time? Yeah, and because that, that's what human nature is all about, isn't it? This is what human nature design is all about. We interact with systems of things. And one thing on its own, if it's, if it's, if it's going to fail us in that way, you're just going to just pop it right in the drawer and forget about it. You know, I mean, heck, I think AARP did a study, I, I don't know, seven, eight, I can't know how long, something on wearables and essentially how long did it take to wind up in the drawer? You know, I mean, Apple watches I'll get. My granddaughter uses one. It's great. It's multifunction, you know, and all that. But you're right. Any, any failure of a promise or anything that is out of norm for this thing and, and it changes your relationship with, 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 with this thing you bought, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Fitbit. You know, I think they created the category, which was great. Uh, but I believe the research you're referencing, which was like eight years ago, showed that in about two weeks, it ends up in the junk drawer for a bunch of reasons, right? We kind of figure out how many steps we take a day in general based on our routine. Great. I take about 6,000 steps, so I need to do a little bit more, right? Or I forget to charge the battery. And that becomes the bigger one. So I forget to charge the battery. I go to put it on. It's not working. I throw it in the drawer. I forget about it, right? So, you know, we, we need to figure out how you have... Um, and, the, and the watch has probably done this the best, the Apple watch, right? Or, or a Samsung Galaxy watch or something like that, that has, you know, it can do your steps, but it does a whole bunch of other things too, right? So it, it in pairing with your phone, it just, it becomes almost like a, an extension of the phone, quite frankly. Um, you know, I used to be a watch guy. Like I had, you know, went and got all the watches. I collect them. I haven't worn any of those watches in probably five, six years because I only wear my Apple watch because of the utility. Wow. That's a great point. Um, last uh, last topic before we get on to some uh, some some questions we always like to spring on our guests. But um, let's talk about founders in the age tech space. Now that's that's who you predominantly see: health tech, age tech. Everybody wants to create something for a reason. You know, whether it's going to be a new sports drink, whether it be, it's going to be a new, I don't know, uh, autonomous driving thing. People are are are, are driven to found companies and found companies in technology. How do you think, maybe two questions, how do you think founders in the age tech space are different and or what, what sort of advice do you find yourself giving to founders in the age tech space that might be a little bit different from, I don't know, traditional? Yeah, yeah. I, I think the, the interesting thing is, you know, every startup has an origin story, right? And when you think about origin stories uh, in the age tech space, most of the time it's based on personal experience, right? It's somebody that had a, a mother or a grandmother or someone that they, maybe they were a caregiver for and they were trying to find a, a solution and they couldn't find it. So they built it themselves, right? We see a lot of that. Um, it's probably the majority of origin stories and, and, and they're powerful, right? So anytime you're building from a place of personal experience, it's interesting, we always talk about, and you referenced it earlier, this idea of human-centered design, right? Like go out and live, talk to the consumer, talk to, 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 to folks. And you know, if you go back 10 or 15 years when the phone was just taking off and mobile apps were everything, most of the people building mobile apps were young males building for themselves, right? Or gamers or whatever. There wasn't a lot of true utility. Uh, and, and so, They'd run to do it, but they, they, they literally were still building for themselves. So the same thing's happening now. I have a personal problem. I can't find a solution. And you see a lot about caregiving. We see a ton here, right? Uh, or even financial services. You know, When you get into the clinical healthcare stuff, we still see origin stories that are personal, but they tend to be from doctors or nurses, someone on the front line. It's like, I don't ever want to see this again. It may not even be personal to a family member. It just may be, I'm done, like I'm, a, I'm an ER triage nurse. I'm done trying to continuously work on people that have this problem, let's solve for it, right? So the origin story is still highly personal, maybe not their family necessarily. So that's what we see more than I've ever seen before. And I've been doing this for 20 something years. Uh, even personally, I my last company, I. I built because we had just kind of a cool idea for loyal mobile loyalty cards. It wasn't for any save the world, big cause. It was just a niche that we saw there wasn't anyone filling. We don't see that. We see this is for a purpose. And there's tremendous passion behind these entrepreneurs. Not to say others don't have passion because they do, but it's not the same, right? Um, so that's the, the, the first piece of this. The second piece, um, because of this, 
a lot of these entrepreneurs are not experts in the area. Again, they're solving for a personal need or solution that they've had. And, and in the health tech side, it tends to wade into healthcare. And so we tend to do a lot more coaching in, in educating on, you know, expense reimbursement and understanding, you know, all the different you know, as your age, right? So there's the Medicare, Medicaid stuff, but there's stuff, you know, we're talking about 45, 50 year olds that aren't on that. And, and sort of how do you bridge the gap in talking to somebody uh, that is, you know, 50, 50 is the new 40, right? Like, you know, and, and you talk about a bunch of 75 or 80 year olds that are using tech every day. And so how do you, how do you talk to them? How do you, uh, in essence, sort of sell to them? And then how do you do the customer service? This is the other big thing, right? And you and I have both experienced this. Many of the people listening are going to chuckle. Um, we've become customer or tech support for our parents or for our grandparents, right? My mom used to call me all the time. How come it's not printing? I'm hitting the print button. Okay, well, now I can diagnose this. Is it turned on? Did you, you know, whatever, right? And, and so there's a, that's a real issue is that the more people are, the older folks are adopting tech, there's a need for tech support, right? Uh, or help, genius bar, if you will, right? Uh, or geek squad kind of things. And yet it's a very tricky situation because um, our research will say that a lot of older folks don't want strangers in their home coming in to help them set something up or whatever, right? So how do you, how do you make sure your tech is designed such that it's easily, easily you know, uh, Trouble, you can troubleshoot it if you need to, right? Without being in someone's home. And so all these are the kind of things that most of the entrepreneurs don't think about, but AARP and United Church Homes, we're thinking about this all the time, right? And so we spend a lot of time educating and, and sort of helping them understand. Yeah, I always like to say, uh, well, two, yeah, two, I mean, we, I always like to say, if your thing runs on a battery, tell me exactly how long it lasts because I'm going to be the one that's driving over there and knocking on a door to change it, which could be good and bad, a way to kind of, you know, get in there and not. And then, um, you know, I always get, you know, folks that tell me, oh, my, 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 my solution could do a hundred things. They take a look at their, at their uh, competitors. Oh, they've got this little thing. I have to have this little thing too. And it's a weird game. And when they talk to me, they'll say, well, we can do this, 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 and this, but they don't really recognize maybe what the two or three things are that my team does the most. Yeah. And how are they optimizing the experience of using that solution so that's really easy and, and, and instinctive and, and things like that? You know, that's that's that that's the difference of human centered design. I can always tell which solutions have been developed in coordination with the users because the UX tends to be a little bit simpler. You know, the tasks are a lot more intuitive. And that's the sort of thing that we like to see, because in our world, workflow disruptions are can can just just sync something so fast. I can't tell you how many things we found in closets just because they require a different dashboard or they do, or, or, or it just, it wasn't even onboarded properly. So all that matters. <laughs> yeah, you, asked, you asked the question earlier about, you know, technologies that I'm seeing that I'm, I, that I'm sleeping on. Like they're, I'm just done with them. I will say, and I'm not sure how much of the audience here is entrepreneurs, um, but both to the entrepreneurs and to the corporate folks that may be watching this. Um, the thing that, that I get most irritated by, when a startup shows me their pitch deck, they all have this competitive matrix. It's usually the four by four graph. And they always show me, and they're, you know, no matter what stays there, they always show me they're in the upper right quadrant and no one else is. All their competitors are lower left or wherever, right? Uh, or they show me the, I call it the car uh, uh, magazine sort of thing where you have like, you know, the different car uh, makers and you have like circles, maybe they have this feature, they don't have this feature. And inevitably, they'll have every feature and they'll show me like some, you know, big company. Oh, they don't have these four, but we have. And that's very telling because you're going, wait a minute. Like you're, you know, a two year old company and you're showing me that you have everything built and you're comparing yourself to some, you know, juggernaut in the industry who hasn't. So one of two things has happened. Either you're wrong and you, you actually haven't built these things or maybe the other company that's been around a long time have tested a whole bunch of these things and figured out customers actually don't want all these things that you check boxes on. And so then my next question will be, what research have you done? What, how many customers have you talked to? Right? Cause the answer usually is not many. 
Right. They went, they went by, well, here's what I think. And when you, and I call that building inside out. When you build inside out from what you know and you think is best, you will always fail versus what you and I would call human centered design, which is outside in. Right. Go figure out what the consumer wants. How is it helping them? How are they engaging with it and build from that back? Yeah. And, and, and if, you, if you've got that, that if you've got that, um, that line with it, every single box is checked or whatever. And then we ask to see a demo and then yeah. you're going to give us screenshots or whatever, then Spidey sense is raised. <laughs> Maybe all that's this right. stuff isn't ready for prime time. So, yeah, that's right. And, and that's a, that's a non-starter, right? Look like when that happens, you, you know, and, and the reality is a lot of times, you know, companies coming to you, maybe they only get one bite at the apple, right? And you're going you know, to look at them once. And if they're, you go through the, oh, show me the demo and they're not, there is nothing, then you're probably not going to look at them again, at least not for a while, right? So you do yourself a disservice as an entrepreneur by not going in and being like, you know what? We, we didn't build for everything. We built this one or two things and we're doing it really, really well. Yeah, I would so much appreciate, you know, coming to me six months before and saying, can I sit down with you and learn a little bit more about what you do, you know, and spend, I mean, we're trying to get our entrepreneur in residence program together, which is great. Come live with us for two, three, four weeks yeah. and see how, see how we operate. But uh, much more ready to give advice and just help foster the creation of something than to be, you know, the, you know, at the sales end of things and getting a pitch. And you can tell that every single one of my objections is covered by another feature and another feature and another feature. You know, yet I can't see that work on any sort of a, a smooth and st intuitive workflow, you know. So yeah. that's, now, now, I'm, now I'm getting all curmudgeonly and it's, <laughs> it's probably good. Andy, um, you've given us a lot of your time. Thank you very, very much for doing this. And on every episode of the show, we do like to ask our guests three questions about aging um, that uh, this sort of supports our idea of abundant aging. And is it OK if I ask this of you? Absolutely. OK, great. So question number one. Andy, when you think about how you've aged, what do you think has changed about you or grown with you that you really like about yourself? Yeah, um, this one is really around sort of uh, EQ, right? Emotional quotient. This is really um, my personal EQ. Other times we talk about EQ in sports or in a job. Uh, we all have our own personal version of that too. Um, about six years ago, I, I took one of these. Um, Myers-Briggs, there's a whole bunch of them, right? I, take them as much as like all your attributes and how you are and whatever. But I took one that was, um, it had two different versions of the same, every question. It was how you are at home in your personal life and how you are at work in your professional life. And I, for a long time, had known always that, uh, or felt like I wasn't, like I, something was out of whack in between how I am at home and how I'm at, at, at work. And I, and I chalked it up all, over all the years to me being an entrepreneur, right? And you know, you start companies, I started five companies and, and when you're doing it, you're working crazy hours, you're, you're, you're all in, right? And so, but I always felt out of balance. And so I took this test and it was, it said, it showed me something that really, really changed everything for me. Uh, turns out that I'm far more empathetic at work than I am at home with my two ch children. And I said, wait, whoa, that, why, why am I far more empathetic with a bunch of grown adults at work than I am with my two young children? And so that was uh, the impetus for me to really start this journey uh, that I've been on now for probably five or six years, um, maybe even seven years now, uh, which is trying to discover um, the spiritual side of me and understanding why am I acting a certain way in different situations. And so I've been on that journey now for a while um, and it's been a fascinating journey and, and, it, and it, a lot of it, as I think about uh, as I'm aging and what does this mean to me, as I'm learning about myself, I'm able to then go have this totally different perspective as I think about my parents or I think about my children or my siblings or my partner. Like it's a very different world that I live in now. I often call it my woo woo world, uh, because of the, the, the spiritual aspect of everything that I've been through, but, but that's totally changed my yeah. perspective on aging. And isn't it interesting, isn't it interesting you use that sort of woo -woo term because, you know, we talk, I mean, you know, this role here at United Church Homes where church is in our name, but I mean, as an open and affirming organization values DE&I very, very closely. I mean, one of the things I've learned 
is really how personal and abstract you know, you know, spirituality can be for you. I mean, it, it can be structured, it can be unstructured. We could be talking about Catholicism, we could be talking about yoga. Right. But this idea of spiritual health, I think is, I think a, a green field, quite frankly, you know, when, when we talk about managed care programs and, and things that aim to, 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 to wellness and aging, you know, because people, you ask different questions as, 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 as you age, as my co-host Reverend Beth says. So um, really, oh, absolutely terrific. Um, okay, question number two: What has surprised you the most about you as you've aged? Uh, yeah, my willingness to embrace change, I think, has been the you know. Again, I'll go back to on the on, on the work side as an entrepreneur. It may sound w weird that I'm I change because I'm, I'm I I thrive in this gray space. I can I can do really well with ambiguity. Uh, in my personal life, that was really hard. Like I didn't like the ambiguity, right? Um, and so it's really, I, I'm surprised that I've been able to really thrive and, and learn to thrive in, in, in the gray, gray area, right? And with that, live with ambiguity and roll with it. Because I never, as a younger kid, I, nope, I was not like that. I was super type A, hard charging, you know, and yeah. So I've completely done a 180 there. Well, I mean, you're, you know, it's, 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 I guess that speaks to the value of experience and the fact that you sort of um, all these different times you've took, taken a risk and, 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 and uh, you know, in the startup world now, you know, you're right. It's sort of an interesting evolution. Um, OK. All right. Question number three. Is there someone that you've met or been in your life that has set a good example for you in aging? Some, someone that inspires you to, as we say here, age abundantly? Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, my my partner, um, she's she's been amazing in, in teaching me how to um, not only uh, embrace change and aging, but dealing with a lot of different health issues. Right. Um, not not me personally, but but family and extended family uh, and, and the level of kindness and generosity that she has um, in the middle of all of this is amazing and extremely inspirational to me to try and emulate because I think about a lot of times, you know, her, her mom has dementia and she's young. Her mom is, you know, uh, you know, I think she's 65, 66 and, and you're watching things, you know, deteriorate and it's a tough thing to do. Right. But, um, you know, my partner is able to have like this tremendous outlook, even though it's a bad situation and always helpful and kind and generous and all of these things that I, I, I kind of think about how would I respond in that situation, right? I have some similar issues on my side of the family and I've always been more to, to snap and jump and be like, I'm, gonna, I'm a solutioner, right? So I'm gonna fix it, I'm gonna solve it, I'm gonna, and, and, and that's not necessarily productive for anyone, Some you know, so to take a step back, take a breath to, to look at it and come at it from an angle of kindness and generosity is what she's taught me most. And, and every day she inspires me to, to try and do better. That's really inspiring. And and uh, and thank you very, very much for sharing, uh, Andy, um, you know, kindness, you know, and, and, and empathy. It's all things that we need. And and. And if you don't have kindness or empathy, you know, <laughs> that, that, yeah. that's one of the key factors of being a good entrepreneur too, you know, that's uh, so. Um, so thank you very, very much for being on the episode of this show. And for our listeners, thank you for listening to this episode of The Art of Aging, which is part of the Abundant Aging podcast series from United Church Homes. And we want to hear from you, you know, uh, what's changed about you as you've aged that you love? You know, what do you think about what we've talked about today with age tech innovation? What do you think is missing? Um, from the world of innovation and aging that, that deserves to be there. Um, talk to us, open up a conversation at AbundantAgingPodcast.com. You can also find us on YouTube under United Church Homes. And a reminder again to check out our Ruth Frost Parker Center, uh, especially our annual symposium at the beginning of October every single year. This year's topic, uh, Ending Ageism at www.UnitedChurchHomes.org slash Parker hyphen center. And before I forget, Andy, Tell us where we can find you. Give us a few things that you'd, you'd want to pitch. You know, the floor yeah. is uh, Thanks, Mike. Um, you can find us and learn all about all the things we're doing at AOP Innovation Labs uh, at the Age Tech Collaborative. 
and that's just agetechcollaborative.org. Uh, and you can learn all about the pitch events, our startups, and, and what we're trying to build. Uh, we, in a very short time, built the largest ecosystem in the world around age tech. We're very honored to have United Church Homes. It might be one of our participating members. In fact, one of our very early members, so thank you. Uh, and, and so that's what we're up to. Um, super excited to just continue to find the most dynamic startups we can. Uh, we, we're, we're constantly scouring the globe uh, to find companies that are really making a difference. So if you're one of those companies, go to our website, uh, check out our events and what we're all about and reach out if you're interested in working with us. If you're a large company, same thing. Come, come join the ecosystem and, and uh, learn all about how to, to build better products and create more value for your uh, audience. And just from United Church Homes perspective, we've loved the experience of being a test bed with the uh, H Tech Collaborative. And again, anybody uh, who uh, is either an H Tech founder, a uh, large company interested in H Tech, www.agetechcollaborative.org. That's it for this uh, this episode. Thank you all for listening. We'll see you next time.